Hello and welcome to TV on TV. I'm State Representative Tommy Vitolo. You're watching Brookline Interactive Group. Today is Thursday, December 9th, and we have a great show. Our guest, we'll interview in a few minutes on a tape recorded yesterday, is Asako Serizawa. She is an author and uh, won a numerous awards, and we're going to tell you all about it. You got to stay tuned. Again, Asako Serizawa coming up. But first, the news. As concerns surrounding Russia's alleged plans to invade Ukraine heighten, President Joe Biden has addressed the issue with Vladimir Putin directly. He threatened significant economic harm if Russia were to invade Ukraine again. Ultimately, this did not seem to affect Putin. In its efforts to investigate the violent attacks on our capital, the January 6th committee will hold former President Trump White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows in contempt of Congress for failing to comply with a subpoena. Pfizer and BioNTech have both found that a booster shot will offer protection against the new COVID-19 variant Omicron. This comes shortly after Omicron cases were identified in Massachusetts. Suffolk County DA Rachel Rollins has been confirmed by the full Senate to be a U.S. attorney. The Senate vote was 51-50, with Vice President Kamala Harris casting the tie-breaking vote. Last week, I joined House Speaker Ron Mariano and several of my colleagues in signing the Global Equity Caucus's pledge denouncing conversion therapy. Also late last week, the legislature enacted a $4 billion ARPA spending bill, including approximately a million dollars in local earmarks for the Brookline Senior Center, Brookline Teen Center, Women Thriving, the Green Space Alliance, the Community Mental Health Center, the Council on Aging, Brookline Chamber of Commerce, and JALSA. The bill also included over hundreds of millions of dollars for housing, climate and environment, and health care, and over a billion dollars in economic development spending. On Monday, the Massachusetts House of Representatives passed Brookline's Colonel Floyd Home Rule petition that I had filed. This legislation allows for the selection of subcontractors with the skills needed to design and build a net zero energy and passive house building. The bill now heads to the Senate before reaching the governor's desk. And that's it for the news. It's a short week. I'm really excited to get us right over to the interview I filmed yesterday with Asako Serizama, a wonderful author. Stay tuned. And as promised, we've got an incredible guest today. We've got Asako Serizawa, and she's got this. She's got this really long bio. All these award, which she's won like awards named after chocolates and awards named after beautiful places in Italy. Uh, and I won't do any of that justice. What I will tell you um, is that she was born in Japan and raised in Singapore, Jakarta, and Tokyo, and um, and she's a remarkable author. And uh, she wrote a book called Inheritors, which uh, has won more prizes than, than I have. And I've been trying to win prizes my whole life. So, Asako, thank you so much uh, for, for being here virtually, right? You're up in, in New Hampshire, if I understand correctly. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I want to get into the book. But first, I want folks to learn a little bit more about you. Um, I, I can cheat because I have your bio right here, but rather than me read it, I kind of like to hear you talk about it a little bit. You, you got some education. Uh, you really do have an award named after a chocolate bar, I think. Um, so tell us just like a little bit about um, how you went from being a smart young person to being a writer and what that journey was like. Well, it was kind of um, an accidental thing. Um, I speak English mainly because I went to British schools um, in Singapore and Jakarta. And um, um, so then when I came here for school, I um, was in the academic side of things and I was a literature major and I actually went to Tufts. Um, and then I went to graduate school for literature and then I decided that I needed a break. Um, and so I, instead of going home to Japan for a couple of years, I decided to apply to an MFA program for, in creative writing. And that pretty much took me in a different direction. So that's how that happened, I suppose. So I, I have to be honest, I've always assumed that 
great writers of fiction just like, you know, dropped out of high school and started writing books or something. It, it, it sounds as if you got professional training on how to be a writer of fiction and then you went and you wrote fiction successfully. Is that a fair statement? I don't think so. I mean, I think that MFA programs have become professionalized in this way these days, but at, at the time, um, that wasn't really the case. And I think that I was just there thinking that I was taking a break, you know, and so um, I didn't realize that I would discover this way, a, a form, I guess, where I could do the academic work that I really liked and found important, but I could do this other thing um, where I could engage with the human experience in these ways that I couldn't um, academically. So I don't know, I think I have a different sort of at an approach maybe and and so you're working your way through school and exploring and being open to uh new ideas and doing things differently and, and you end up um with this degree in fine arts and then you start receiving awards right so so like <laughs> was it was it like you wrote a book and then you got a bunch of awards or like you won some awards, so you wrote a book, so you got more awards. I want to know about the awards. I, you know, <laughs> I'm fascinated. Um, tell us about, tell us about O. Henry. Tell us about Pushcart, about Rana Jaffe. Tell us about all of it. Well, you know, I mean, it took me about 13 years to write this book. And so it's been quite a journey. And um, I mean, awards, you, you know, I, I think, you, you don't have any control over these things. You know, you can just do your work and hope for the best. And I'm not one of these writers with millions of things in the drawer. You know, I, I kind of write slowly. And so I don't have that much material, um, but what material I did have, I suppose I worked on enough. <laughs> um, I don't know, I think a lot of it is timing, you know? I mean, I think you have to do the work, you have to do, um, but more mainly, I think if you do the thing that you care about, hopefully it translates somehow, you know, into something, um, into a career resort. Although it's hard to talk about careers and writing, I think, but either way. <laughs> yeah, as someone who, who, um, who works on things on a, on a day by day basis, or even an hour by hour basis, the idea of um, crafting something over that period of time is, uh, you know, something I hope to do in retirement. Maybe I'll you know, build a ship and a bottle or something. I, I don't know. Um, but I, I want to talk to folks a little bit about the book itself. And, and so I've got a summary that I'm going to read, which I don't normally do. And I suppose this probably happens to you all the time because you're an author and people read the summary and then you talk about it. So just you know, think about your grocery list or something for the next three minutes. Um, so spanning more than 150 years and revolving around the Pacific side of World War II, Inheritors paints a kaleidoscopic portrait of five generations of a family scattered across Asia and the United States. Grappling with the legacies of loss, imperialism, and war, the characters and their stories collide with one another, illuminating the complex ways in which we experience, understand, and pass on our tangled histories. A retired doctor is forced to confront the moral consequences of his wartime actions. His brother's wife, compelled to speak of a 50-year-old murder, reveals the shattering realities of life in occupied Japan. Half a century later, her estranged American granddaughter winds her way back east, pursuing her absent father's secrets. Decades into the future, two siblings face the consequences of their great-grandparents' war as the world shimmers on the brink of an even more pervasive violence. Sarazawa's characters walk the line between the devastating realities of war and the banal needs of everyday life as they struggle to reconcile their experiences with the changing world. A breathtaking mediation on the relationship between history, memory, and storytelling. So the book focuses on characters who live in occupied Japan and the US and who travel between the two places. And you were born in Japan and travel to the US and I suspect have been back to Japan at least once since then. And so how much of this story draws on your experiences and the experiences of people you know? Well, you know, I think, I mean, it's an interesting question because I think that um, 
the whole project sort of started because, you know, in Japan, um, World War II is just this ubiquitous topic. You know, it appears in media, it appears in news all the time, um, different programs. Um, but, you know, no, not many people actually talk about their experiences. And this was true of my grandparents who lived through the war and my parents who lived through the occupation. And so I actually grew up not knowing too much about it besides what was, you know, generally known. I also grew up in Southeast Asia. Um, and, you know, these were places where um, that were occupied or invaded by Japan during that time. And um, I didn't really know much about it because I went to these British schools and the, the education was a bit colonial in this way. And so, um, you know, I knew more about England and Europe than about Asia and Japan. And um, so, you know, I think that it was sort of like trying to write into these gaps, you know, and um, trying to um, talk about this kind of history from a different perspective than these official narratives, whether that's a, in terms of the, um, in Asia or in terms of in the US, because here too, I think um, certain narratives about this war exist, but not really about, um, well, they're pretty one dimensional, I think. And so your, you know, your Twitter bio, I can't help it, right? I go, <laughs> um, your, your Twitter little, little quote um, says that you care about aesthetics and politics, their collusive impact and imaginative possibilities. Um, and most of those words have more syllables than the words that I tend to use, <laughs> but I can't help but notice the word politics. Um, you know, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, I suppose. And so what the heck do you mean by that statement? I'm, you're an author. You didn't just spit it out there and move on. You thought about it. What are you getting at? Well, I think that, you know, I'm kind of interested in the ways that, because like, I think you think about books or you think about art, you think about aesthetics in that sense, uh, something that's outside of political engagement, you know, and to me, that aesthetic um, component is very much political in the sense that, um, it had, you know, you're talking about representation, you know, you're talking about the way that you are representing a culture or people a history, you're talking about all of these kinds of constructions, how narrative is constructed and how it's used. And so, you know, I'm kind of interested in the ways that, you know, art and um, books writing um, do that, you know, and how that, how it kind of intervenes in these processes, or maybe it doesn't, I don't know, you know, but I think in my mind, because you are putting out images, because you're putting out um, something about a culture or a history, it feels political, like a political gesture in that sense, you know, and I'd I like to look at it in that way. Um, and I think my writing, in my writing, I try to do that, you know, I try to write against conventions, um, maybe traditions, um, definitely official narratives that exclude so much from its um, narrative. So Sako, you, I don't have a lot of guests who aren't somehow related to Brookline town politics or, or state politics. This is, this is exciting for me. Um, but um, in, in some ways, you're, you're simply a storyteller, right? And um, so I wonder what you think about storytelling and politics and if there's uh, too much or not enough or if they've got it all wrong or if it's more important than people who aren't storytellers have even noticed. Uh, surely this is something you've thought about at least a little bit uh, and, and I'd like to hear about it. Well, it depends on how you describe storytelling, if you mean like, because I think everything we do is storytelling, you know, and I think some of it is instrumental, you tell a story for a reason. Um, other times, if you mean storytelling as in telling people's stories, that's a whole other kind of question, you know, so I think it depends on how what you mean by storytelling. Well, surely, over, you know, you, you could fill that in. What do you, what do you think? Um, maybe I'll say it a little differently. Um, how should um, people in politics um, use storytelling to help communicate and persuade? Hmm. I think, you know, one thing about storytelling um, and this is kind of tricky because 
I do think everything is storytelling, right? Um, you're telling something from a perspective. Um, but if you mean like, you know, in terms of persuasion, I think, you know, storytelling, one of the things that maybe distinguishes it is sort of like its appeal to um, some kind of human experience or maybe some kind of more the emotional register, you know, or something that's not so in the head, you know, so an argument in that sense, you know? And so I think, I don't know, it's dangerous, you know, to do that. And yet I think it's essential in the sense of if you wanna reach people or if you wanna create communities, I do think that um, that kind of approach is important, you know? to try to appeal to people on that level and talk to people, you know, about their lives or maybe include somebody's life experience or something like that. And are you available to write press releases and speeches? <laughs> Not at the moment. <laughs> I'm, I'm giving you a hard time. Uh, I couldn't help it. Um, this week was the anniversary of Pearl Harbor. Yes. And, um, Growing up, I didn't understand the significance of Pearl Harbor to people who were my grandparents' age and older uh, until September 11th. And while that's a very different incident in a very different place, the immediate understanding of how an event can sort of become defined forever uh, was obvious to me. And your book includes you know, World War II and Occupy Japan as a setting. And so uh, Americans are very bad at asking about or listening to or understanding what the heck the rest of the world thinks. Uh, and so I wonder, um, how are the impacts of World War II still playing out in Japan? Well, I think, well, I want to back up and just say a little bit about that. And I think it's that, you know, one thing I've noticed about World War II here, especially when it concerns the Pacific side, is that, you know, the narrative sort of begins with Pearl Harbor, then ends with atomic bombing, and then basically, and, and so that's been the sort of narrative. And one of the projects of this book was to try to put the that history in a larger context, you know, within the context of world history, but also more of a philosophical um, context as well, you know, in terms of the kinds of worldviews that led to this type of war. And, um, and then, you know, because it's, it spans over a century and it kind of ends in the future, it was about sort of trying to understand the trajectory of this thing and, um, you know, talk about the ripple effects of this history. And it's exactly as you said, I think World War II, um, you know, you think of it as being something past, but there's curious ways in which it comes up. Um, and I think 9-11 is a great example of that, you know, where some, some image, um, Pearl Harbor or Kamikaze pilots were basically you know, taken out of context in a way and used in a different kind of narrative. Um, in Japan, I think, you know, World War II is still very much um, a flashpoint, you know, political flashpoint. And so it is always in the news. And, you know, and I think that the the narratives around it is, is from a very sort of nationalistic perspective, no matter who is um, talking about this history or using it. And so um, it's sort of, uh, you know, to write against those kinds of narratives and to put the humans back into the equation. So I think I've got another question that's similar, but I, your perspective is interesting to me on it. And that is, um, how are the impacts of World War II still playing out in the United States, right? I think you have an interesting perspective on this. And I, I just wonder, um, you know, at the risk of, of, of treading, you know, in a place where it might be uncomfortable, um, if, you, if you do have any thoughts, I'd like, to ha I'd like to hear them. Well, I think that, you know, I mean, I think the US has leverage in many ways because of that war. And I think that in many ways, the structure of the world and, and where the powers are concentrated aren't 
haven't really shifted that much, you know, and I think that um, the legacy of the US, um, the World War II and the US um, involvement in it um, is still very much present in Asia, for example, in the sense that the, um, the US military is very much present there, you know, and very active. And, um, you know, I think for as a writer, my concern is about, um, you know, how cultures are understood and how that informs the way that um, people interact with each other, you know, and I think it's true in this country too. I mean, I think that World War II is not so known, it's at least in terms of the Pacific side, you know, um, I think relatively speaking, um, not many people talk too much about that side of the war, you know, and so, um, but I feel like that war has to be understood, um, the Pacific side of it, you know, because I think more and more um, we're kind of interconnected in these ways, you know. And I would add that more and more uh, of Americans are AAPI descendants. And that I think is, you know, look, Asia and the Pacific Islands is a massive space with a huge number of billions and billions of people with very different cultures. Yes. And so you know, the Japanese are a sliver of that. And the Chinese are by population a larger sliver of that, right? Um, but it's also the case that um, immigration into the United States from uh, Asian countries is not random, either in the source or the destination. And so in the US, we tend to have, not always, but we tend to have um, enclaves, communities, where there's a large fraction of first or second or fifth generation immigrants from maybe the same country, maybe even a, a, a smaller place within a country. And uh, the community that I represent, uh, most of Brookline, uh, is more than a quarter AAPI. And it's my observation that many of the white people in my community haven't noticed it. Certainly more than zero, but if you ask them to guess, they wouldn't use that high a number. And so I think it's really important for us to be thinking about um, history, present and future. Uh, in terms of uh, how we uh, incorporate uh, AAPI culture into American culture and whether it's assimilation or some other kind of integration or you know the, the fruit salad model. Um, in my community, we recently added Asian New Year as a school holiday, right? Which was really exciting and complicated and confusing because not every, um, AAPI subcommunity wanted to be on the same day even, right? It's, it's complicated. And, and I think that's part of our life uh, in modern times as well. Uh, and so I, I think all of this is really interesting. And I love hearing about it from someone who spends time thinking deeply, right? Who, who spends a long amount of time on one work. And so, so I wonder, you've got, a, you've got another book coming and you started it like 10 years ago. So it's probably <laughs> just a couple of years until out, right? I mean, that's, is that a fair, that's probably not right. What's, what should we expect next? Well, this is, the first book is actually part of a quartet or tetralogy. And so looking at this kind of war in, in different ways and because um, there's a lot that it couldn't get into this book, you know? Um, and I think as, as, you know, in terms of what you were just saying about the AAPI community, I think one thing that, you know, seems important to understand is that it is diverse, you know, that it's not this monolithic Asian community either, you know, and um, there are so many lines there, you know, and, and I think that diversity is important to understand, you know, um, because things affect things differently, different things affect people differently. I noticed your Twitter account um, had more than one or two uh, tweets related to Asian hate uh, and violence against Asians in America. And I wonder if you want to just sort of share a little bit about, about where that comes from for you and, and um, maybe give us some insight there. I think, you know, in the end, you know, there's a long history of this, you know, it didn't just erupt now. Um, and, you know, I think um, it's a little bit different, you know, I think different kinds of racisms come out in different ways, and some are subtle, 
you know, and some are not overtly violent. Sometimes it breaks out in these ways. But, you know, I mean, it, for me, it's a structural issue, you know, meaning that like, you know, people aren't necessarily uh, meaning to be racist. You know, I think that um, it's systemic, it's structural, you know, um, I think, but I think storytelling is one way to start to look at that, you know, um, and just conversations like this, maybe, you know, um, and what you do, you know. So um, in terms of that, I think it'll take a while, I would imagine, you know, but I think it's beginning. Um, and certainly I think in Brookline, you know, um, I feel, I do, I do see the community growing, which is really quite lovely to see, so. Well, Asako, um, really wonderful spending just a little bit of time with you uh, this afternoon here on Brookline Interactive Group. And I know, um, you know, you're probably spending a lot of time polishing all of those trophies, right? The O. Henry prizes, the push cart, <laughs> the, the fellowships, uh, the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown is, has been, right? There's so many, um, so many words. And I, I'm poking fun at it a little bit only because I serve on the Joint Committee on Tourism, Arts, and Cultural Development, and they're sort of like, we haven't identified a lot of great tools for state government to support the arts, and the arts are really broad, right? Um, so we like, you know, we, we underwrite some awards, and we come up with some grants, and then we like support restaurants and hotels, because that's, you know, a big part of tourism. Uh, it's sort of this disparate, disparate thing, but... Um, yeah, the awards are the awards are important because uh, there's a lot of you know it's easier and easier to put a book out, but uh, you know we still need help finding the good ones. And sometimes uh, maybe one or two awards aren't enough, but if you got you know six or eight, that's that's a good clue. So so we do have to wrap up. But Asako Serizawa, wonderful for you to be here. I encourage folks go out and um, get inheritors. I'd rather you buy it from the booksmith than Amazon. Yes. I'd rather you buy it than not. So um, figure out how that works best for you. And uh, really, really lovely to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for watching Brookline Interactive Group. I'm Tommy Vitolo, and we'll see you next week.